Hey everybody, welcome to Diversity. Let's be diverse. Hey, uh, so this is our first lecture. I'm going to try this uh, and I'm going to try to cover some really good topics and um, I have a feeling it's going to be a little bit shorter than if we were in the classroom because I would be telling endless stories about this and that, which I may still play, tell some stories. But if it gets long, I might break up the video into two parts just so it's easier to upload onto um, YouTube. I hope everybody's doing well. You're enjoying your downtime. <laughs> <coughs> it's a dry cough. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a bizarre time. So let's just, uh, let's just move like we've been doing this for years. Okay. One of the things I've noticed uh, during this uh, coronavirus pandemic is I've been, besides the fact I've been drinking a lot of coffee, apparently I've been collecting coffee mugs over the years. I didn't really realize that until now. So uh, today's lecture is brought to you by the Elvis, Elvis Week 2004 mug that I got in Memphis, Tennessee when I was hanging out, uh, staying at the um, Heartbreak Hotel across the street from Graceland in Memphis, Tennessee in 2004. Mm, tastes just like the king. Okay, so let's get on the road. So we're going to cover four kind of general topics today to get oriented because there's just so much to discuss in this class. And as I was putting it together, I was thinking, oh my gosh, um, we really have a lot of things to cover. So I just wanted to kind of get this week rolling by some introductory con concepts. Um, and then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the kind of the idea of the end project that's still sort of formulating in my brain because we've had to adapt everything for this new world that we live in. So our four concepts that we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about uh, introducing the, 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 the basic idea and definitions of diversity. What do we mean by diversity? Um, talking about why trauma is important to this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this is my work on trauma could feed into this discussion about um, diversity. Talk about the role that socialization plays, how we learn about diversity. And I think a lot of you folks who have had other sociology classes, this will be a refresher course for you. And then talk about a little bit about the tortured concept of multiculturalism, excuse me, multiculturalism uh, and why, uh, when we talk about diversity in America, it's not so easy. So those are our four concepts. So let's jump right into it. Um, and I imagine that I will have sent you a discussion question around this that um, that you'll be responsible for responding to. Okay, let's do this. So first of all, when we define diversity, what does diversity mean? What does it mean? Things are diverse. Uh, you know, if you were to look at a textbook definition, um, it would say a range of different things and you know, of some type of variety. Awesome, right? That's pretty, there's a diverse, there's a diverse everything. There's a diverse uh, set of music in my vinyl room here. There's uh, the jazz and the Beatles and uh, rock. And then there's rock over there and folk music and Zambian uh, traditional Congolese music. Uh, so, you know, variety, yay, variety is the spice of life. Just that there's a lot of different things. Is that a useful definition of diversity, just that there's a lot of different diverse stuff? Or is there a sort of sociological uh, definition of diversity that's more useful? And usually when we talk about diversity from a sociological perspective, we talk about um, a difference in social categories, the way we sort of define people as members of groups. Sometimes we use the word demographics. So social categories like race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexuality, socioeconomic status, nationality, uh, nation of citizenship, veteran status is one, uh, parental status, body size, ability, life experience. I mean, there are all kinds of sort of social, religion would be one, uh, all kinds of sort of social categories. So usually from a sociological perspective, when we talk about diversity, all, yeah, all people are different. Some people like crappy music and some people like me like awesome music you know there's all this sort of there are two types of people in the world the people that like cilantro and people that suck sorry i like cilantro so uh yeah we could talk about sort of how we're all different as a form of diversity but what we're really talking about from a sociological perspective is these socially constructed categories that we assign people uh to become members of uh, like race, like gender, like national origin, like disability and ability status. 
So does the diversity just mean that there are a lot of different categories of people in the world? When I was putting this class together, I started thinking about really good songs that get at diversity. And there's a, I'll have to include a link because you don't want me to sing because there's a really great Sly and the Family Stone song called Everyday People, later covered by Joan Jett and the Black Cards. Ah, 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 we're everyday people. There goes a black one followed by a white one. You know, is it just sort of this uh, amalgam of these different categories? I mean, that's sort of getting at it, what we mean by difference, uh, dif uh, diversity from a sociological perspective, or is there some element of power in it? When I say that, I'm going to start getting sociological here. Does it mean dif uh, diversity is difference from the norm? Air quotes. Ching, ching. I'm going to have a little sound effect that every time I do air quotes in this class, there's some sound effect that I can do on my, my pro ching, ching. Uh, you know, what is the norm? What is the norm? Does diversity mean uh, things that are different from the norm. For example, often when you hear about, you know, there's going to be a diversity celebration, uh, it means something other than white people. Because white people can't be diverse, they're the norm. If we're going to talk about diverse sexualities, it doesn't mean we're going to talk about heterosexual people. It means we're going to talk about all the other letters in the alphabet, LGBTQ++++. Um, so uh, so there, that implies that there's a power structure, that there's sort of a a dynamic that defines what is the norm and what is statistically diverse from the norm. So we, when we start talking about diversity, we are already getting into some key uh, ideas in sociology about, um, about power, who defines what's normal, about privilege, who has the ability not to have to worry about issues like diversity because it's somebody else's problem. Uh, and uh, who gets included in that conversation. I mean, this is one of the big conversations that we are having, especially in the quote-unquote white liberal uh, category about diversity. You know, if we want to celebrate diversity, that usually means inviting some non-white people to some event and saying, look how diverse we are, and then sending them back to where they came from, where they were already diverse in their own environments, and patting ourselves on the back because we practice diversity. That's not diversity. That is a performance, a performance of diversity. So um, so part of this uh, discussion about diversity from a sociological perspective, because this is a sociology class, is what is the power dynamic in defining who is normal versus who is uh, kind of an exception to the cultural norm? And the perfect example of this, and I hope we have a lot of time to get into this, is the concept of ableism. You know, when we talk about what's normal, often people with physical disabilities and mental disabilities are excluded from that definition of what's normal, uh, but they're normal too, right? I mean, they're just as normal as anybody else, and who divide, divide, de decides who's kind of part of the normal club and who's disabled? Are they disabled? Are they differently able? Do they have abilities that maybe I, as an able-bodied person, uh, don't have? Um, and... God, we're going to be doing this a lot. Uh, that, um, and so we have to really get into this power dynamic. And it's just really uh, increasingly annoying for progressive people to kind of proclaim their uh, celebration of diversity when it really means just kind of acknowledging the people who aren't like them and then going back to a world that's oriented towards themselves. So we really want to deconstruct that. And it's one of the reasons I've chosen this book, um, White Fragility, to read because this is a book that's going to challenge a lot of people. I think it's going to be super useful for non-white people to understand where white people's heads are at and why they have such a hard time dealing with something, you know, playing the race card. Uh, people of color play the race card every single day. Uh, when anybody brings up the issue of race to a white person, they get all defensive and you're like, you're playing the race card. Uh, so it's, I think it's going to be a useful book in understanding why white people are so uh, challenged by this discussion of, uh, about race uh, and that I think will help non-white people to understand the, you know, what the hang up is. But it's going to be especially challenging for white people to be able to look in a mirror and say, hey, I've never thought about it that way. I've never thought about it that way. And so it, people are, are um, I think, going to be shooken up a little bit by this book. Uh, just in the first couple chapters, they're just going to push some buttons. So I'm really excited about getting to that conversation. We're going to do it uh, a little bit on our Wednesday, um, a little Wednesday chat. All right, Elvis. Because this is Elvis, there is a little bit of whiskey in this coffee. 
and coffee liqueur. Hey, there's a pandemic, all right? Give me a break. Okay, so that so we're defining diversity uh, sociologically in, a, in a, a broadly defined notion that there are numerous social categories that we can divide people into. And so diversity is how many of those categories are included in our conversation. It's not a very useful definition, but we're thinking about it as categories of people as opposed to this person, you know, likes this type of sushi and this person likes that type. You know, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about categories of uh, diverse categories of people. Okay, so that's number one. We got that down. Ten minutes got down. Uh, the second one is talking about trauma. Um, and how do, what is the connection between diversity and trauma? Why is it, why, why? Well, those of you who have had my uh, social problems class 206 know that trauma is a big theme in my work, especially around the issue of hate crimes. And um, the question I would sort of start this little section about off is how does and I want you to think about this this might be a discussion question for us how does not honoring diversity how does not honoring diversity cause trauma how does not honoring diversity cause trauma so what do we mean by trauma um, the definition the sort of textbook definition of trauma and I'm going to read it from my notes from 206 uh, trauma is often the result of an overwhelming amount of stress that exceeds one's ability to cope or integrate the emotions involved with that experience. And I'm putting it up on the screen here, so you have it if you want to write it down. I encourage people to take notes during this class, even though I can't see you writing or scribbling or eating a sandwich in your pajamas. Um, I would encourage people to take notes because, you know, it could be on the midterm, as they say. Uh, the idea of, uh, of, of having an overwhelming amount of stress that you can't handle. And that trauma can come from an acute source. So one of the ways I think we're most familiar with talking about trauma now is people coming back from war, you know, who have seen people being blown up or have seen people being killed in front of their eyes. Uh, <clears throat> we also talk about trauma in terms of uh, victims of violence, sexually, especially sexual violence, and how that acute experience about of being a victim of some violent act uh, can stick with you and be hard to just get over. Uh, but we also talk about trauma coming from chronic sources. We have some pretty good research now that talks about trauma coming from poverty. You know, not knowing where your next meal is coming from every single day. Not knowing how you're going to be able to pay your rent every single month. Um, not knowing if you're going to be able to afford school or, or you know, the life that you live you know, on a constant level, that there can be that source of overwhelming stress that makes it harder to deal with. And we know that um, that trauma can be long lasting after an incident, um, that you can have a soldier from World War II who, you know, got out of the war in 1945 and still carries elements of that trauma with them. Vietnam veterans certainly are an example uh, under what we have now called PTSD, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, uh, people coming out of prison experiencing trauma, people who are victims of child abuse having lifelong trauma. Uh, we had, um, last fall, we had a, um, a tornado in our neighborhood in Northeast Portland, strangest thing you wouldn't expect. And I was in the car with my wife, Andy, and our daughter, Cosette, and uh, the t tornado blew right by us, ripped out a tree, and smashed it on a power line while we're in the car. And it was pretty exciting, I have to admit, because I didn't think it was a tornado. I just thought it was, you know, end of the world. Um, and just today, there was kind of a heavy downpour uh, in the neighborhood. A big windstorm came through and rain, and my five-year-old freaked out. She freaked out and started worrying that trees were going to fall. And I didn't even think that... That was because that experience of being next to that EF0 tornado, a relatively small tornado, was lodged in her brain. And now every time the wind kicks up, she remembers that tree crashing and the, the electricity sort of exploding and the, and the fear around that. And that is something that will probably last her a long time. I can imagine when she's 25 or 45, when 
there was an intense storm. She remembers being in the car and seeing that tree being pulled out by the tornado. Those things can last a long time. I also have to say, anytime I talk about trauma, we got to talk about resilience. People are incredibly resilient. Veterans, victims of rape, all kinds of people that have experienced the sort of worst trauma you can imagine. Um, they can be traumatized, but they can also be incredibly strong and resilient in the face of it. So I always think it's important to balance those out. But the question is... Um, sort of twofold. One one is, and this is what we're kind of dealing with, what is the chronic impact of being marginalized? Of being a marginalized population, marginalized because of your religion, because of your gender identity, because of your sexuality, because of the color of your skin every single day. Study just came out from Rutgers uh, earlier this year that found African American children every single day experience an average of four overt examples of racism. Right. That's got to add up for every single day for not just, you know, like, oh, is that racist or not? For very clearly um, defined racist experiences every single day. Black kids in America in 2020. Right. What is the cumulative effect of that as a traumatic experience? Uh, and then the other question then is, how does that manifest? How does trauma manifest? What what what? happens to people who experience trauma, whether it's from an acute source or a traumatic source, how does that manifest? And we know all the social ills that we associate it with, including mental illness, including suicidal uh, behavior, including drug addiction, including divorce, including chronic you know, pain problems. I mean, there's just sort of a whole lion's list of things that can be um, uh, magnified by the experience of, of being traumatized. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, so I'm saying this right at the beginning in our first lecture of the class for a couple of reasons. One is we want to talk about this diversity thing, but we also want to link it to the trauma that a lot of people carry with them uh, that people of privilege, including me, might not even see. I might even see, and, and, you know, people will say, well, just get over it. It was just a joke. I didn't mean anything by it. Oh, you know, you're taking it too seriously. There is a chronic well of trauma that is built up on people who have been marginalized, and we can't just write it off and say, get over it. It's 2020, get over it. Without a black president, get over it. You know, we just, we have to acknowledge that. So the first part of that is this is going to be kind of a theme through this class is looking at the trauma element here, and I'm going <coughs> to be coming back to it. Sorry. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. Oh, God. I've heard that the the alcohol kills the virus. Is that true? Is that true, Elvis? I don't know. Um, the, um, but the other thing that's important is to say is that the material that we cover in this class, the material that we talk about, and talking about racism and sexism and homophobia and xenophobia and you know all these sort of things that undermine the value of diversity can be traumatizing there is some material in here that will be triggering we won't be getting into some of the you know more intense stuff like sexual violence um but the reminder of why diversity is so hard for some people meaning people that don't experience the privileges that i experience might be a reminder of oh crap like thanks for reminding me what a hard job of actually getting to this point of honoring diversity actually is so there, there there may be some triggering conversations in this conversation i want to say that this class is designed as a safe space we're allowed to make mistakes we're allowed to say things that we think are right and then turn out to be harmful to people uh i want us to you know feel like we can all sort of express ourselves in this class but um but we also want to be mindful of the fact that sometimes some of the stuff, and I'll try, you know, if I think there's something that is particularly triggering, I'll try to give people a warning. But it may come out in our Zoom conversations. And so we just want to be super mindful of that. And one of the things about this is the issue of privilege, which we are certainly going to talk about. My privilege as a cisgendered, white, able-bodied, middle-class male, wasp male, whatever, means I don't have to see a lot of the trauma that people experience on a daily basis. It just flies right by me. But other people experience things uh, on an emotional level, and I need to know that. So I'll give you a really good example from a diversity training that I was doing. I was talking about hate groups, and we'll talk about hate groups in here. And I was, had a PowerPoint presentation, and I, you know, used some images just so it's not text alone. I want to keep people kind of engaged. So 
I was talking about the Ku Klux Klan, and I had an image of the Ku Klux Klan in their white robes burning a cross. Right? It's iconic. You've seen it a thousand times. And I just, you know, put it up there and didn't think anything about it. And after the discussion, this African-American woman came up to me and she said, you know, Randy, I really enjoyed that presentation. It was very provocative. But I want to tell you, when you threw up that image of the Klan on that slide, that's how my grandfather was murdered. And once that image was there, I really kind of lost lost focus. I couldn't really pay attention to what you were saying because I was thinking about my grandfather being murdered, and I was thinking about how those people are still out there and want to murder me. I completely, I didn't didn't even see it. It just, I didn't even think about it. It was just, I was just throwing up an image. But she experienced that on a very emotional level. So part of this conversation is being able to be aware of the fact that there are people carrying trauma, but there are also people who seem to be completely immune to it because of their privileged status. And that's also challenging because there's a lot of people don't want to think that they have privilege. We all have privilege. Every single one of us has some type of privilege. Um, and we have to work that in. So the trauma piece, the trauma frame, as we're calling it, uh, is going to be kind of central to this around those issues of understanding what the manifestations of chronic trauma are, but also why there are so many of us that just don't see it. And again, using Robin DeAngelo's book as a way of making white people more mindful of how they can traumatize other people with a simple comment, like, oh, you, you know, get over it. Um, yeah, right. Okay, that's going to be good. I can't wait to talk about that book. Okay, the third thing, the third topic that I want to get into is um, a little bit more sociological. Hey, why don't we do this? So what, just to make this a little bit easier, let's break this up. I'm going to edit this part right here, and then um, we're going to come back. We'll do this in sort of two parts. I think like two 20-minute parts might be kind of good. Okay, well, I'm figuring this out as I go. Just So this is part one, and then don't go on to the, whatever the, the videos over there are that say, hey, look at cats, uh, Trump press conference. Uh, click on to the next one, and I'll, I'll send the link out. Okay, here we go. Thank you.